praise our God for his goodness, but to remember that he's always faithful in every need we have. I'd like to introduce our, our speaker, uh, Bill Birch. Uh, let me give you a little history. Um, can I? Um, you can thank uh, Pastor Birch uh, as uh, our pastor's mentor. He spent many years uh, just uh, being there for Pastor Curtis and supporting him and uh, from for the last 18, a little over 18 years. So, uh, but he started many years ago as our, well, our DS is his last role as far as I know. And we really appreciate him coming to help us out this week and, and the message that God has prepared on his heart. And Pastor Birch, I'm not sure, do you still go by Pastor? Okay. Whatever. Whatever. Please join us. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. They say my Lord was not divine, but walked as all men walk, was bound by sin as all men are, and talked as all men talk. They say he's not the Prince of Peace, and peace cannot impart, but he has placed settled peace in this poor fainting heart. They say he could not cause the dead to rise and give them life and make them whole, but say, my friend, he put his work in my soul. They say he could not bring a calm upon a stormy sea, but friend, he calmed the storm of life that nearly shipwrecked me. They say he could not cause the the blind to see the sun spear raised, but he has opened my blind eyes and changed my nights today. They say it that fed no multitude on the fish and the bread, but there was a hunger in my soul, and that hunger has been fed. They say he could not cause the rock to become a living spring, but he has changed my burning thirst to a leaf this world could never bring. I wasn't there in Bethlehem when the Son of Man was born, nor yet in Nazareth as the years sped on. Nor yet in Galilee as he taught there by the sea, nor in old Jerusalem when he gave his life for me. I didn't see the empty tomb on Resurrection Day. I didn't stand on all of it and watch him go away. But I am here in a world of sin, saved by grace divine, to testify that this same Christ has changed this life of mine, to tell to those who live in doubt because they cannot see that Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God, can set a sinner free. And it's real, praise God, it's real. Boundaries are all wide open. Aren't you glad you're a Christian today and you're walking in fellowship? It's a joy for Jan and me and some of our friends to be with us here today. And uh, I want to do something just a little bit different this morning. I spent some time the beginning of this year, talking with Jesus. And it was during one of those times that uh, I was reminded of something that took place at Universal Studios in California. They were in the process of making a film and everyone was intensely involved in finishing up the scene and all of the studio was dark, the cameras were grinding away, the actors were doing their skills in a very excellent way when all of a sudden, the outside door opened up and filled the room with sunshine, thereby messing up that particular segment of the film that they were filming. And in burst a fledgling young actor, and he looked up and he said, Sir, I'm to be in this scene. The director turned and said to him, Well, who are you? And the young man responded by giving his name. The director said, no, I, I don't want to know your name. I want to know what part you're to play. The young man said, well, well, sir, I don't know. And then the director said a, a remarkable thing. He said, young man, you better go back to central casting and find out who you are and what you're supposed to do here. As I spent some time with Jesus, he seemed to be saying to me, Bill, don't you think it's about time that you went back, that we went back to Central Casting? Back to the one who started this whole thing to find out why you're here, why I'm here, why you're here, 
And what in the world are we supposed to be doing? And as I went back, I heard Jesus say, Bill, as you're approaching now the 21st century, you're living one of the most destined making errors in all of history. You think it'd be very challenging and complex, and it is. But in many respects, it's similar to the day that we gave birth to Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, my father sent me down to present earth on this planet. I was sent with a mission to seek and to save the lost. My assignment was to start a movement that would embrace that mission. I, it would reach the world and would last forever. I had three years to put that mission in place. That fellowship, a movement that would continue to work the work after I left. When I came to planet Earth, there was a bureaucracy in place that was saturated with Phariseeism and impressive with legalism. There was all kinds of political and religious ideologies that were going around. My mission, to seek and to save the lost, ran cross-grain with much of the religious pharisaicalism that was in the teachings of the day. One day, a young attorney came and asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? And I told him, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On this rest all of the laws and the prophets. I remember one day, Jesus is talking, one day up in north in Caesarea Philippi, I wanted to see the effectiveness of our teaching. And so I asked them, what do men say I am, or who do they say I am? And they gave me a lot of speculative answers. They were going around. And then I said, okay, but who do you say I am? And Peter gave the answer, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. I confirmed that answer. You have answered rightly. You did not get that out of a book or a class, but from my father. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to keep it out. Jesus continues as he's as I'm talking with him. Toward the end of my time, I, I told him, you've learned much. However, there is, there's one thing that is missing. It's a plus factor that you should know and experience called the Holy Spirit. You will not be able, men, ladies, you will not be able to fulfill your mission of our movement without him. You do not fully understand this my disciples right now, but I'm, I'm going away. And I'm going to leave you, but I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And when He comes, He will not only be with you, but He will be in you. He will make your heart clean. He will empower your life. He will grow in you the fruits of the Spirit. Affection for others, exuberance for the life, eternity. You will develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in your heart, and a conviction toward basic holiness that permeates things and people. And then you will find yourself a loyal commitment, not needing to force your life. Rather, you will be able to marshal and direct all of your energies the fruit of the Spirit that you display will last. These men did as they were instructed. <coughs> they waited in fellowship and in prayer with one another. And he came just as he had promised. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus continues, but Bill, you would have had to, needed to really have been there to believe it. The Holy Spirit came with such empowerment and such excitement. These men came out of a place over in that city called the Upper Room. And they went out into the streets and the marketplaces telling what had happened. And that day resulted in 3,000 people becoming a part of that movement, the church. Shortly before I left, 
I took these men up into the hillside and emphasized once again the mission of the movement that was being left to them. I reminded them again that all authority has been given to me. Now I am giving you men and ladies that same authority. You're to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all things that I have taught you. And as you go, I'll be with you to the end of the age. And they began to go. And the movement of the church began. But the nature of a movement is to decline. The tendency of fire is to go out. The characteristic of love is to grow cold. In many places, the church began to carry on business just as usual. Not very much excitement. At the beginning of the century, Jesus continued, in the early 1900s, my father, the Holy Spirit, and I moved upon the name of a man by the name of Phineas Brzee. Brzee was a very successful minister in the Methodist Church. He began to see, though, that there had, there had been a drift in purpose and a, a loss of focus and excitement from the commandments that I'd given to the young attorney that day that I was teaching, that I'd given to the men of the movement, my disciples. In response to the Holy Spirit's leading, this man helped the rebirth, the revitalization of a movement, a church a denomination that was named the Nazarene. It was called the Church of the Nazarene. The basis for their coming together was to focus back on what I had said. Love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. They put some contemporary terms on the, the for that day. They talked about sanctified holy. They were known as a holiness denomination with an emphasis upon the spirit-filled life. However, the essence of all they preached and proclaimed was wrapped up in that first commandment that I gave that young attorney that day, love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the great commission that I gave to my disciples back there in those days. And with that driving force and focus, this part of the movement the Church of the Nazarene has grown now in remarkably well. Now, Bill, you, along with every other organization, are facing a new millennium. And we're asking one question. What are the biblical principles that will help us as we focus on the future faith? What are the core values that should that distinguish this 21st century movement. Jesus continued, I would respond with the answer that I gave to a young attorney when he, when he said, love God with all of your heart, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Out of this are the laws and the prophets. And ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you that as I spent that little time in dialogue with Jesus this past week, getting ready for this service and getting ready for this, this new year, when I went back to Central Casting, back beyond Brzee, the founder of the church, back beyond John Wesley, back to the one who said, my mission is to seek and save the lost. Back to the one before he left, as said, As my Father hath sent me, so I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Some time ago now, Billy Graham was uh, planning a citywide crusade in the United States. And there was in a group of people discussing it, and one of the pastors there is reported to have said in the planning meeting, because he was really not a supporter of Graham, he said, if this crusade here, Billy Graham, if we have that, if we go ahead with this action, he will set this church back a hundred years. Billy Graham heard that, that hundred years. And he replied, a hundred years? I want to set the church back 
2,000 years back to the time that it all began. I heard Lee Anderson speak some years ago now. He was telling about a young seminary student who was instructed by the professor to give the sermon the next Sunday, next morning in chapel. The novice was struck with fear in having to address that whole group. The next morning in the chapel, they all gathered. The young student stood in the pulpit. His hands were trembling. His knees were knocking. His voice was quivering. All that was going on. There was a long pause before he spoke. He looked out over the congregation, his audience, and he asked a question. Do you know what I'm going to say? They had no idea. So they all shook their heads, indicating no. He said, only the new I would stand for the benediction. His teacher didn't appreciate that at all. And so he called the young man into his office, and he said, hear me. You must, for the, your own good, present a devotional in chapel tomorrow. The next day, it almost happened. The exact thing happened as the day before. His hands were shaking. His knees knocked. His voice trembled. And there was a long pause. And he looked down and he said, Do you know what I'm going to say? And they all indicated yes. Then he said, well then, if that, if you know what I'm going to say, there's no need for me to say it. <laughs> Professor Barry Angle brought the young man into his office and he said, if you do that again, you're going to be confined to your room for 30 days. <laughs> the next day, the chapel attendance was at an all-time high. They wanted to see what this young man was going to say and what was going to happen. And exactly the same thing. He stood, his voice quivered, and in a long silence, he looked at him and said, do you know what I'm going to say? And after three days of this, about half of them knew what he was going to say, and the other half didn't. Some nodded their heads, you know, and some shook their head in the other direction. The young man looked at them and said, let those who know tell those who don't, let spam be dismissed. <laughs> Now, folks, we, we smile and laugh at that. But that's what we're to do. Did you hear me? That's what we're to do. Let those who know tell those who don't know. That's the biblical definition in making more disciples. Let me wrap it up real quick. Back some years ago now, there was an international psychiatrist. Congress that Madrid, uh, convened in Madrid, Spain. There were some 4,000 psychiatrists there from all over the world, and a few clergymen and nuns that slipped in. In the closing session, it was on, the session was announced as human values in psychotherapy. Now, don't let those words get you off track and say, I'm not going to tune in here anymore. The first was a speaker, Dr. Jerome, past president of the American Association of psychiatry. He spoke for 35 minutes. Now mind you, this is a meeting of psychiatrists. He spoke for 35 minutes and he said, men, build faith in people. And he spent for 35 minutes about building faith as a human value. The second speaker was Dr. Bowers of West Germany. He spoke for 35 minutes on hope. He said, we've all had clients who have come to our office. We've counseled with them. They've had the dreary eye, the dreary face, the dead soul. And then suddenly, without any explanation whatsoever, they experienced what we call the phenomenon of hope. And they became alive and they were healed. He said, I don't want to disagree with my brethren. It was just a moment ago. But he said, men, our job is to build hope. The third man that was getting ready to speak was Dr. Valdez from Lima, Peru. He spoke for 30 minutes on the enormous healing power of non-judgmental love. He said the greatest force healing today is non-judgmental love, unselected, unconditional love. He said he was speaking only to psychiatrists, but he said everybody else loves conditionally. You agree with me and I'll accept you. You disagree with me and I'll, I'll reject you. He said, only we as psychiatrists can love people unconditionally. 
And as I was reading down through that, I wanted to stand up and say, wait just a minute. I know a man that loved unconditionally some 2,000 years ago. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't start just loving us when we repent. He loves us before we even show any tendency toward repentance, doesn't he? Hey, are you with me? I've got some people agreeing with me. It's in the Bible. That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we build faith, hope, and love, it's great. And I thought of the Protestant churches here in America, almost suffering from a, what I call, a neurotic anxiety hang-up. And here are the, I don't have to be relevant today, and here are the psychiatrists saying, give them faith, give them hope, give them love. That's what every red, black person wants. Faith, hope, and love, unconditional love. And that Victor Frankl just so time before had said this as he was talking to a group of preachers. He looked at him and he said, listen you guys, if you preachers will do your job, you will put us out of business. Giving them faith, hope, and love. I can imagine Jesus coming into our gathering here this morning asking the question, what are the core values that move you in the 21st century? And I give you the Founder's words, love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength and might, and love the neighbor as yourself. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the essence of spirituality. It is holiness in contemporary language. Can you imagine what could happen this year if we had this church and some 60 other churches that began to do this? I know this has been a little different than anything that I, that I have ever done here before. But as we have closed out the last year and beginning to move into the new year, I began to work with some things for my own life and for churches that I work with. I've entitled it Renewed, Renew, Restore, Revive, Church of the Nazarene, question, Rising Above the Ordinary. <coughs> for such a time as this, listen carefully, and I'm sharing my heart now, a confused, chaotic, convulsing world gasping for life and breath, will not be touched by a tame church, mouthing time-worn cliches and pious platitudes. To affect a dirty world, it will take a pure church. To infect a sad world, it will take a joyous church. To rescue, rapture, an apathetic world, it will take a live church. To heal a sick world, it will take a healthy church, a well church. It will take a church that's unafraid of sickness, unaffected by roadblocks, unflinching in the face of criticism, unmoved by persecution. It will take a church that dares to dream big, to work long, to work desperately, to plan carefully, to fight bravely, to storm the gates of evil and lethargy. It will take a church that is unwilling to compromise, more than willing to sacrifice, more than ready to be inconvenienced, and more than anxious to risk. It will take a church whose strength is equal to her task, claiming all the gifts of the Spirit, all the power available, and all of the authority given. It will take a church with godly gusto, prevailing prayer, demonstrative determination, and a victorious venture to win the battle. It will take a church that is divinely sent, moving, planning, conquering, supernatural power. And Jesus said before he left, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he looks at us as he looked at them and he said, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
and you shall be my witnesses in all of the world and outside of that. And my conclusion to that, great days ahead. What do you say we get with it on that? Amen? Praise the Lord. And so that, that's just kind of from what God's been doing in my heart at the beginning of this year. And I want that for you and for us. And so we're going to stand. And what I just read is something that I've worked on for a number of months for my own life. If you want a copy of that, that's available to you. It might be something you want to read every once in a while as we're striving to move into this brand new with successful Christian advancement in the past. God bless you as you go. Father, thank you for your presence that has been here with the way. Thank you for your promise that you will go all the way with us, walk beside us, keep us sensitive to what your spirit is saying, the direction you're going, and may these be the best days this church has ever known in their walk with you and touching the world. In Christ's name, amen. Good day, and the Lord bless you as you go. Hold on, not just yet. Thank, thank you, Pastor Birch. We really appreciate your message. Um, inspiring, to say the least, our pastor is dead. Um, pastor Birch doesn't slow down. It's just amazing that uh, we look at our lives and think, okay, it's time to rest. Well, Pastor Birch's example that they're in God's, in God's kingdom, it's not time to rest. It's just time to keep acting what God, acting out what God's called you to do. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, if we could have